Don't you see how cruel the world is to me? I want to apologize to everyone who ever knew me from like sixth grade to the end of high school. And honestly now, if you know me now, I'm sorry. We're gonna have a lapse in time for part three of this thrilling saga of I read you my journals uh, from when I was a young kid. My last two have been about like me in first, second, and fifth grade, which was honestly delightful. Um, we're gonna skip ahead to my middle school years and I've got it tabbed off to where we should begin, which I think is just at the beginning. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna give you a fair warning, this is- If you thought fifth grade me was dramatic, wait till you meet seventh and eighth grade me. We're gonna Jane air it up in here. Chapter one, the background story. To some people, this is just another story. To me, it's special. It's my story, my is underlined. Maybe it's vain and self-centered to write about oneself like this and think others will pick it up and read it, but Maybe it depends. I'm writing this story because to me, I think it deserves to be on paper. And if you think there's something worth learning or sharing in this, well, I'll leave that open for you to decide on your own. I have a confession, though it's probably obvious. In no way, shape, and or form am I perfect. I was not, am not, and never will be considered perfect. Don't even imagine me as being some kind of saint writing this. I am not dot dot dot, but perhaps I wrote that in a subconsciously arrogant manner, and I'll show you exactly what I mean in a bit. I've got problems. <laughs> this goes along with proving the point that I am not perfect. When I was, quote, younger, unquote, before the conversion discussed in this book. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, I had a come to Jesus moment. It involved some demons. I don't want to get into that. I was, if you will, an arrogant, self-centered, attention-starved, stage-hogging brat. There's a lot of self-loathing in this, which is very sad because we went from, it's great to be me, to I am dramatic and I nothing is in my life but vanity. I wanted people to look at me like a saint, but even back then I knew saints don't want to be saints and that's exactly why they are saints. To this day, I still have evil, arrogant, self-conscious, subconscious thoughts like that and that's why I'm always stating that I'm not a saint. But. I still feel like I could be doing this subconsciously for the great irony that I may or may not be aware of. I'm so dr somebody put me in a soap opera. Like, oh my- You see the internal conflict that I go through every day? That's not all of it though, no. When I was little, I wrote books like I do to this day. Only back then, I was the main character. Oh, the vanity. And these books were fiction. I was the main character and the books were fiction. I really talked myself up to. I, Rachel, the protagonist, was the top of the class. I was the smartest. I lived in a mansion. I was rich and I had all the answers. Totally snobby, I know, but that's who I was. I might have done a lot of that just to make myself feel better. In second, third grade, I had troubles. I had troubles in second and third grade. I had an insanely large imagination that I loved and secretly hated at the same time because it got me made fun of. I didn't have too many friends. Lots of imaginary ones. That's how it's always been. I was Miss Imagination, the Misfit. Attack yourself. I Miss Imagination, the Misfit. To understand my choices made later in this story, you must know a bit about my background, which is why I never titled this chapter The Background Story. Now that you know the basics of my past life, hopefully the rest of the story will be a bit easier to follow now. P.S. I'm not normal. <laughs> Chapter 2. Ah, fate remains a beautiful thing. It was the first day of middle school. That means new teachers, new grade, and lockers. Lockers. The very thought of it is overwhelming. At our school, you can't just walk in and 
go to class. No. You have to walk into the multi-purpose room. A cafeteria slash gym. And stand in neat little lines and wait for ten or so minutes with the rest of your grade. Then the principal comes and gestures to your grade that it's okay to walk down the bloody hall. <laughs> to this day, I still don't understand why we did it. My first day at a public school, I was all confused. Like, okay, where's the standy line thing? I never went to public school. I never went to public school. I was in Catholic school for 12 years. I'm just making shit up. So we're standing in our lines, which are actually more globs with little room and foam numbers on the ground to identify the grade, with all our locker supplies and nice little plastic bags tied up at the top, usually being the wallflower that I was. I would have stood there watching other people converse in the hollow in circle of all morning conversation, wishing that I had the skill to start conversations with people I didn't even get to stand in that dang circle, but not today. No. This time, things would be different. Turns out, the people I labeled as popular, which is just everyone except my friend group that consisted of five people, actually functioned as a normal human beings. Today, they let me stand in the COAMC, the circle of almighty morning conversation. I was overjoyed, confused, and confidence and inclusion pulsed throughout my entire being. I loved it. Too bad I still sucked at talking to people. Then the first wave of fate hit, and his name was Scott. The moment I saw him, I didn't like him, but it wasn't exactly dislike, it was just like, he bothered me. Irk at first sight. This is terrible. I'm sorry, Scott, if you ever saw this. I think Irk at first sight might be a part of predestiny syndrome. What? <laughs> part of what? Which is when your mind identifies something about a person that you'll encounter later on. Your brain finds a way to try and alert you to it then. The only reason I think this is true is because Scott said I irked him when he first saw me. Wow, we just fucking hated each other from the get-go. We both have no idea why, but now I'm blaming it on the PDS. I don't know why he irked me then, but within a few days time, I had some justifications. Scott, the child prodigy. This dude was smart. And remember what I told you. I was self-centered. Jealous back then. I knew he'd treat, he threatened me a little as one of the smartest people in the grade. Scott raced cars professionally. I put professionally in quotes because I don't know if that's actually true. I just heard it from Katie, but I consider professional because he travels around on races and the weekends all the time. Sounds like NASCAR Junior to me. Then Katie gave me some news. She had a crush on the kid. Jeez, my best friend. I didn't care that much, despite the fact that, to me, he was still Urkalicious. She started talking to him, and with a few weeks, the two were pretty good friends. It didn't bother me, but he sure did. Our lunch table was sad and pathetic, and only half full. Then the second wave of fate hit. Emma. Why? What'd she do? Up until this point, I had known her, but I don't think I'd talked to her much at all. I don't know for sure what drawn her to our table. Either way, one second, she hadn't been there. The next second, she was. Boom. There. Instantaneously. She was talkative and eccentric, so she easily joined our group. The thing about her, though, was that she was from a completely different world. The world of the populars. So, of course, she wasn't exactly like us. Quiet and studious. Emma was the first one to rock the boat. But it was the next boy who would change our lives forever. And then it ends. <laughs> I don't even know who I'm talking about in this form. All it has on the next page, chapter three. Only the beginnings of a tragedy. And it is completely blank from there on, so I'm really glad that this stopped. There was uh, a lot of weird uh, stuff that went down with my friend group once we all started having crushes on each other. Um, and I found that to be very unpleasant. And I think maybe I was working through some of that in this. I don't know what to say about that. I have no excuses. I was very angsty as a child. I had a huge chip on my shoulder. Um, I was very emotional, very upset, and I took it out in my journals. So if that was you or someone you know, I'm sorry. This, I think, concludes part, what part are we on now? Three? I hope you enjoyed that riveting, riveting tale. And you know, Subscribe.
I just splashed my own eyeball. Mine own eyes have been splashed. 